Hello friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we will be seeing the current affairs of 22nd February 2019. The articles will be seen for prelims are the six. First article is about the Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan. Second article talks about the recent judgment of Supreme Court with respect to Forest Rights Act and due to the judgment, lakhs of forest dwellers face eviction. Third article talks about United Nations Security Council and United Nations Security Council's recent statement on Pulwama attack. Fourth article talks about India and emerging markets make a case for special treatment in World Trade Organization. Fifth article is about the new external benchmark rates for floating drones according to RBI. And the final one talks about India and Saudi Arabia relationship. The first article for the day is about Indus Water Treaty. This article was taken from the paper Indian Express. Indus Water Treaty is a very important water sharing treaty signed between India and Pakistan in the year 1960. In this topic, we'll see about the Indus Water Treaty, its provisions and also the current problems faced under this treaty. So for the prelims, we have to know about the provisions of Indus Water Treaty. So this water treaty signed in the year 1960, as I said before, was signed between the Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru and Pakistani President Ayub Khan. So this treaty, it divides the six tributaries of Indus into two, the West Bank tributaries and the East Bank tributaries. The West Bank tributaries include rivers Jhelum, Chenab and Indus and the waters from these three tributaries are allocated to Pakistan. And the East Bank tributaries include the lower tributaries that is Ravi, Bees and Satlaj. And the water from these three tributaries are under the control of India. However, the treaty allocates total of 80% of the water from the six tributaries of Indus to Pakistan. So if you see the geographical location of Indus and its tributaries, India is the upper riparian state and Indus uh, and Pakistan is a lower riparian state. So that is the Indus flows from India to Pakistan. So, certain restrictions are placed on India for building storage systems such as dams or hydroelectric power projects which may block the flow of water to the lower riparian state that is Pakistan and currently there is, uh, there is about 3000 megawatts of hydroelectric power generated from the West Bank tributaries that is the tributaries which are under the control of Pakistan. In case of any bilateral problems arising between these two countries in the implementation of this agreement, there is a separate commission set up to manage it. The commission is called as Permanent Indus Commission and it was set up as a bilateral commission to implement and manage the treaty efficiently. Currently, this uh, water treaty is being brought back to news because of the Jammu Kashmir attack on the CRPF officials. So, there is a statement uh, released by they cut down the excess flow of water along these three rivers. The second article for the day is lack of forest dwellers face eviction. This article was taken from the paper Hindu. This article talks about the recent Supreme Court order on the Forest Rights Act of 2006 according to which lakhs of the forest dwellers currently living in the forest may face eviction within few months. So this recent Supreme Court judgment will evict the, those forest dwellers whose claims as forest dwellers have been finally rejected under this law. So the recent Supreme Court order, it leads to eviction of lakhs of persons belonging to scheduled tribe and other traditional forest dwellers across 21 states. So those who face evictions include those forest dwellers whose claim have been rejected by the law under the Forest Rights Act. So for this, you have to know about the provisions of Forest Rights Act. So this Forest Rights Act was enacted in the year 2006 and this was considered as a landmark judgment because it aims to correct all the historical injustices that the forest dwellers were facing since the British period. It recognizes the rights of forest dwellers and the rights are classified into two groups. One is individual rights and the second one is community rights. Under individual rights, a scheduled tribe can claim the rights and continue to live in the forest and depend on the forest produce for one's life. Under community rights, this act recognizes the Gram Sabha as the nodal agency and it also gives the community the right to collect, use and dispose the minor forest produce, right to use the forest land for grazing and also has the right to use the water bodies in sustainable manner. However, the implementation of the Forest Rights Act has faced a severe criticism as it has a multi-layered hierarchical procedure and several tribal groups face problems in proving their recognition and thus they cannot exercise their rights because the recognition is rejected under the multi-layered system. So here in the, for a forest tribe to get recognition, they have to prove it under Gram Sabha and later with multiple appellate tribunals at the state level. So without uh, the tribes who don't have this recognition under this law, under this procedure will now face eviction under the Supreme Court order.
This recent supreme order and the eviction of the uh, forest dwellers show the lacunae in implementation of the Forest Rights Act as several scheduled tribes who are residing traditionally for generation into the forests may face a severe threat of eviction from their own land. The third article is about United Nations Security Council. In this article, we'll see what is United Nations Security Council, its structure and its permanent members and also the problems present in United Nations Security Council according to prelims perspective. So the United Nations Security Council, uh, yesterday it issued a statement. So the statement condemned the Pulwama attack and it also underlined the need to hold those responsible for the act accountable. The statement also significantly named Jaish-e Mohammed as being held responsible for the attack. Uh, so for the films, uh, you have to know about the United Nations Security Council. So the United Nations Security Council is a 15 member body and out of 15 members, 5 are the permanent members and 10 are temporary members who are elected for 2 year terms. The 5 permanent members have uh, special rights called as veto rights and the members are China, France, Russia, United Kingdom and United States of America. The non-permanent members, they hold 2 year terms. And out of the 10, 3 are from Africa, 2 are from Asia, 2 are from Latin America, 2 from Western Europe and others, and 1 from Eastern Europe. So the primary function of United Nations Security Council is to maintain peace and security. It is the only organ of United Nations that has power to make decisions that the member states must implement. So the decisions of United Nations Security Council are binding. The decisions of other United Nations bodies such as General Assembly are not binding whereas the decisions of Security Council are binding on all United Nations members. So now we will see the functions and the powers of United Nations Security Council. So under United Nations Charter, these are the listed functions of United Nations Security Council. As I said before, to maintain international peace and security, to investigate dispute or any situation that might lead to international friction which may in turn affect the peace and security of the international community. The United Nations Security Council can also recommend methods for adjudicating such disputes. Here you also have to know about International Court of Justice which is a special United Nations body which is set up for adjudicating such disputes and the judges of International Court of Justice are appointed together by United Nations Security Council and United Nations General Assembly. Uh, apart from this, the Security Council also formulate plans for establishment of system to regulate armaments. It calls on members to apply economic sanctions and other measures which may even involve force to prevent uh, or stop aggression. So under this provision, United Nations Security Council has uh, laid many economic sanctions on nations such as Iran. The United Nations Security Council can even take a military action against an aggressor. And any admission of new members into United Nations must be recommended by United Nations Security Council. It also exercises the trusteeship functions under United Nations in strategic areas. The appointments of uh, the members of General Assembly, appointments of Secretary General as well as the judges of International Court of Justice are based on the recommendations of United Nations Security Council. The fourth article for the day is India and emerging markets, they make a special case for special treatment in World Trade Organization. And this article mainly deals with the provision of special and differentiated treatment that the emerging markets and India claims under GATE agreement. And we'll also see about the problems between the developing and the developed countries in continuing the provisions of special and differentiated treatments. So here you have to know about special and differentiated treatment. So this treatment was first agreed upon in Doha Ministerial Summit of WTO and later it was implemented from Bali Ministerial Summit of WTO. So according to this, it exempts certain developing countries like India from the same strict trade rules and disciplines that the developed countries must follow. For example, developing countries are given longer time periods to face the export subsidy or even tariff restrictions. However, the developed countries must face this off in an early period itself. So this special and differentiated treatment is only for developing countries. The least developed countries like countries of Africa are exempt from any reduction commitment itself. Uh, however, the current problem is that the developed countries are cherry picking certain trade and economic data of the developing countries and they are questioning the implementation of the spe special and de differential treatment that is awarded to the developing countries. However, we all know that in spite of the development made by the developing countries, 
countries like india china venezuela or south africa are still poorer when compared to developed countries like united nations for example india is still home to 600 million poor despite rapid economic growth the country is facing right now when compared to other countries of the world the gap between the developing and developed countries is also widely reflected from many indicators apart from gdp and poverty such as undernourishment production and employment gap and even uh, in agricultural sector so the mutual treatment between the two groups that is developing and the developed group is necessary in order to implement the provisions of multilateral organization of wto smoothly the next article is new external benchmarks for floating rate loans rbi tells to in indian banking association so this article talks about the new external benchmark rate which will be applicable from this year replacing the marginal cost of lending rate which is currently existing from the year 2016 Many factors. The monetary policy transmissions is delayed in India. So one factor attributed to that is the follow-up of marginal cost of lending rate. So earlier, before implementation of marginal cost of lending rate, a rate called as base rate was implemented, and this was replaced by MCLR rate in 2016. So this is a rate below which a bank cannot lend any loans to its customers uh, except in certain cases that is specifically mentioned by RBI. So currently we are following a rate called as MCLR rate and this rate is changed every month. So monthly updation is done and based on this rate the every individual bank it fixes the rate at which it lends to its customers. However in order to ease the uh, monetary policy transmission further RBI has now proposed a new rate called as external benchmark method in order to improve the transition. So under this external benchmark rate it will be a floating rate linked to four external benchmarks the four external benchmarks are repo rate treasury bill 91 days rate and treasury bill 182 days rate so these treasury bills are money market instruments which means they are short term rates and the third is corporate deposit rates So as we all know repo rate is under the uh, control of monetary policy committee and it can be changed every quarter according to the decision of the monetary policy committee and T bills which are money market instruments highly volatile and it reacts to external conditions which means that any change in the external conditions will now be manifested in the external benchmark rate so this will show frequent changes in the base rate and This will further ease the monetary policy transmissions by the banks and finally the customers that is the people who get the loans will be benefited. This will also help in the credit offtake in the economy and thus help to restore the health of Indian economy. The final article for the day is about India and Saudi Arabia relationship and this article talks about the depth of diplomatic relationship existing between the two countries India and Saudi Arabia. India and Saudi Arabia has seen steady progress since the year 2006. 2010 was a landmark year between the relationships of India and Saudi Arabia a strategic partnership was signed between India and Saudi Arabia in that year so we all know Saudi Arabia is a very oil rich country so India is a country which depends totally on its external support for meeting its oil demand about 80% of its oil needs are exported from other countries and Saudi Arabia is a very important trading partner and in this scenario saudi arabia is very important oil trading partner with respect to india about 19% of the total oil imports of india are coming from saudi arabia apart from this the bilateral trade between both the nations that is between india and saudi arabia it uh, values to about 28 billion dollars and saudi arabia is fourth largest trading partner of india and india is also the fourth largest trading partner of saudi arabia so it is a win win situation between both the countries So recently uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia visited India and in that visit series of agreements were signed uh, agreements especially in the area of infrastructure housing tourism and exchange of audio visual programs were signed between both the countries negotiations also happened in the areas of political economic and military areas they even set up a comprehensive security dialogue that will happen consecutively to address the security issues that is uh, happening in the asia region thank you